Hello and welcome to this cultural event from the British Library. I'm Brett Walsh of the events team and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation about the new book Small Bodies of Water by Nina Minga Powles. Now before the conversation begins I just have a few points of housekeeping. If you'd like to buy a copy of the book you can use the button just above the video. You can also donate to the British Library, send us your feedback and watch previous events. Below the video you'll find a question and answer form. We will be taking a Q&A at the end of the event so you can submit your questions to us using the form below the video. Nina's going to be joined in conversation with the writer Kerry Nee Doherty. Kerry's book Thin Places was highly commended by the Wainwright Prize judges in 2021. She's also written for The Guardian, the BBC and the Irish Times and she currently lives in the heart of Ireland in an old railway cottage with her family. So without further ado, I will hand over to Kerry and Nina. Thank you. Hello, welcome everybody. It's such an honour to be here as part of the British Library's Natural World series, um, series of events on climate change and nature writing. And it's my absolute pleasure to be um, talking with Nina Mingya Powells. Hi, Nina. Nina is a writer editor and a publisher from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I hope I've said that right. She is the author of three poetry collections, including Magnolia, which was shortlisted for both the Ondante Prize and the Forward Prize, and Tiny Moons, A Year of Eating in Shanghai. In 2019, she won the Nan Shepherd Prize for Small Bodies of Water, and we'll talk a bit about the prize later. And in 2018, she won the Women Poets Prize. She's the founding editor of Bitter Melon. Nina was born in New Zealand, partly grew up in China, and now lives in London. Nina won the Nan Shepherd Prize, which is a biennial literary prize for underrepresented voices in nature writing. And her book, Small Bodies of Water, which, as um, Brett said, you can buy through the link and through your local bookstore, is an absolutely gorgeous read. Jessica J. Lee has said, with poetic precision, Nina shows us what nature writing can be. Amy Liptrot said, it is a beautiful personal journey, a gorgeous read. The big issue, have called it mesmerise mesmerising. The language is like a flower pressed between the pages of a book. And just today I had the pleasure of, um, at my break time, reading a gorgeous review by Catherine Wolfe, who said in her words today, small bodies of water buoys the reader up. It brings moments of lightness closer to the surface. It felt like being underwater. It was one of the best reading experiences of my life, which I can echo um, again and again and again. I've, I adored your book, Nina. I, I love all of your work. Your poetry is glorious too, but it's absolutely beautiful to be in conversation with you. And yeah, so welcome. And, and how are you feeling right now, a few weeks into your book being out? Yeah, thank you so much, Kerry, for your beautiful introduction. Um, it's really lovely to get to finally speak to you. I feel like we've <laughs> we've met before, but we actually haven't, so it's no. real special. Um, yeah, I'm feeling all right. I'm feeling. I'm feeling very busy. Um, I I kind of can't remember what. Oh, it was about six weeks ago. I guess the book came out. So yeah, um, and a, the, yeah, a lot has happened since then. Um, yes. Quite a few. Yeah, quite a few Zoom events and and maybe one or two that were kind of semi in person which was really exciting yeah it's been really exciting yeah that's really great and I suppose when I was preparing to talk to you and I knew we only had an hour in total and there are going to be questions from the audience so just to say that in case I forget that you can submit just under the link underneath we will be taking questions from the audience but I I just I couldn't imagine how we would possibly talk about your wonderful book in just an hour and so I suppose I've kind of tried to bring it right down so that we can find some of the threads maybe that you might not necessarily have spoken about that much because I know that 
um, I've watched and I've heard some interviews with you and a lot of the same themes come up rightly so but I suppose some of the things I want to ask you maybe are um, are just about you because I think that writers quite often um, especially writers like how you write your work um, so much more goes into the book than what we really see and I suppose I wonder if you could talk a little bit if that's okay about the process because I know that small bodies of water grew out of an absolutely gorgeous sort of I suppose haunt um, smaller part of it that was um, firstly on the amazing willow herb review so I wonder if you could talk about how it came how it shape-shifted what how did the shape-shifting look like for you and for the book I would love to yeah so yeah as you said uh, there was a an essay I wrote uh, it must have been maybe two and a half years ago now uh, which uh, was under the same title yeah small bodies yeah. of water and um and I wrote that uh, to submit to the Willow Herb Review, which is an amazing journal uh, for nature writers of colour and mixed race nature writers run by uh, Jessica Jaley, whose words you you quoted earlier. She's yeah. incredible. Yeah. And yeah, I wrote that uh, specifically to submit to that journal, which is it's quite exciting when that happens I, th I think when you see a call out and think oh, maybe I could put something together just for this and Jessica's own writing on water and the body and swimming has been um so profound for me as a mm -hmm. writer and um she kind of her words kind of gave me permission to write more about water and bodies of water and so that essay was kind of the beginning of that but um, but then I, I realized not too long after that essay was published that I actually had a lot of older scattered pieces, some quite short bits of essays, some longer, which uh, they, they did seem a little bit connected by water. Yeah. And it was only around then, so around two years ago, that I started to think, you know, maybe I could put these pieces together. Um, but at the time of writing them, I wasn't thinking of it as working on a book or even a, a long project. Um, I've just, I've always enjoyed experimenting with different types of writing. And so as well as poetry, I kind of, when I was first started out writing, I tried out different types of essays and I never thought of it as a big project. I think I maybe couldn't even have mm -hmm. written them, you know, if, if I'd had this um, kind of looming big project in mind. So I feel really lucky actually yeah. that I managed to um, have these bits that I'd kind of drafts, not necessarily anything amazing, but ideas that I tested much earlier, quite a few years ago. And then when I saw the uh, Nan Shepherd Prize had opened, yeah. I think I saw it on Twitter probably. Yeah. Um, and then I thought, you know, maybe I could find a structure mm. and begin to put the pieces together. And so that's a very, yeah, that's a very rough mm. overview of how it happened. <laughs> but um, but it's definitely that that essay that was in the Willow Herb Review yeah. that really kind of ended up being like a blueprint for what later ended up becoming the book and it's and it ended up being as you know the first essay in the book yeah it's almost like operates like an introduction although I didn't think yeah. of it that way when I first wrote it yeah. um but it yeah it was really useful for me it was almost like mapping the journey that the book would take completely and I think you've spoken really beautifully about how how that process worked for you and I suppose in your work what there is as well that word mapping um it does kind of come up again and again because you look at identity and what it means to belong and you look at the body and what it means to be you in the world um but I suppose as well you speak on a much more universal level as well like so many people I've spoken to about the book particularly women um, have said yes like just it just sang to me and even earlier on Instagram when I shared that I was doing this event I had so many people come back to me and say oh my goodness this book is just 
really changing my life. And I suppose that um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what it feels like. And I, I hate I, I hate asking this question, but what what does it what does it feel like to put such personal things on paper? Because I know it's not always easy. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think at the time when I'm working on a essay or a poem uh, or anything, really, I kind of have to. And maybe you also might have this experience. I have to not think about who's going to read it um, or, yeah, not think about how is this too personal? Yeah. Is this too much, you know, mm -hmm. um, in the very early stages in order to get stuff down on the page? I think I really have to just maybe only go as far as thinking, oh, you know, is this something I would want a friend to read, like a, a close friend of mine? Um, and then it's only later that I might you know, with probably with the help of my editor, I think, in the case of this book, yeah. um, to figure out, yeah, what, what, how, what, what's too personal, or, um, you know, how much maybe doesn't need to be in the book, and I think Jessica, who we just mentioned, mm -hmm. Jessica Lee, she's, I've heard her speak brilliantly about this, about yeah. setting boundaries, um, because, as writers who write nonfiction, I guess sometimes readers might have this notion that maybe our whole lives are kind of now out in the open, but that's totally. definitely not the case. Totally. Yeah. So right. for me, I I enjoy I do enjoy writing about very personal things, but in a way, maybe just as simple as sometimes changing really basic details that aren't that important to you know the the narrative or the story or just mentioning something but I feel I don't always feel I need to go into such detail um and I think my editor was wonderful in in really um standing with me and in, in, in having those boundaries and in the end though I think it's all it's still a very weird thing and there's still yes. probably passages that because I remember when I did doing the audiobook was a very very strange experience <laughs> and, um, and that's probably the most kind of intimate closeness that I might have with some parts of the book that I probably wouldn't choose to kind of read aloud very often you know at an yeah. event like this or at a bookshop which is really interesting that's so um, interesting yeah even though we know that readers will go away and you know read the whole thing and yeah and, and that's I'm, I feel oddly okay with that but perhaps there's some sections that I just put out there and then maybe that's that's that <laughs> that makes that makes perfect that that honestly makes perfect sense and it's really mm. well put um and it kind of leads in quite nicely into something that I'm d absolutely dying to ask you which is that so in your book you I think that you kind of you show these really glistening moments of just the everyday, like how you deal with food or with memories or with your dream life are just the same as how you deal with like really big things like earthquakes or worries or family anxiety. And I suppose I want to ask you, um, I want to know, do you journal? Do you, do you keep a diary? And if so, what does that look like? What kind of format is it in? And then also how do you, weave that into your beautiful work mm. um yeah I love talking about this yes <laughs> so you ask, um I, so I have a notebook but I've never been the type of person that keeps a diary um even when I was young like I never did mm. I think I, I tried to at one point because I had an, this notion that you know like real writers will like write in their diary every day or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's actually not the case and so I, I I don't do it like regularly I don't do it daily but I have a I have a notebook and it's kind of more like for me a place well it's literally a place where I write stuff so I don't forget it <laughs> and it's like lists it's more like fragments and and lists or lines from things I'm reading yeah sometimes I'll jot down um very often it's yeah images the things that I've seen and I won't necessarily know if it's going to be useful or not yeah. you know, in a, for a project or 
um, or a poem or anything. Yeah. I really, I'm a big list maker, so I'm constantly making lists. <laughs> yeah. I, and yeah. So my journaling pretty much takes that form, and it's. Yeah. I should be doing it more because it is so useful for me mm-hmm. when later on when I might there might be a, a poem that I want to work on or um you know a commission or something and it later if I can go back and find things that I've written maybe about a particular walk I've been on or, or a meal yeah. that I ate that's yeah. so useful uh, but it is it's hard like even yeah. I think the effect of the last 18 months is, is just for me being generally like mm-hmm. less creativity less yeah note taking less reading as well and so I'm kind of I'm slowly building my way back to kind of (laughs) pre-pandemic levels when I would try to note take as much as possible um but I so I also use my phone a lot at my I use notes app constantly probably lately I use that a lot more yeah and again it's just lists and the weirdest yeah the and sometimes my dreams are in there and I look at it later and I'm like what this is makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I, I I see you as a list maker and when um Catherine Wolf in her um review earlier her beautiful review earlier um made her own list at the end I, I kind of imagined that that would like touch you in some way but yeah, You're really well, good. that, that yeah. was really great that was a really lovely answer um so yeah so I suppose as well like what you've mentioned about like inspiration for poetry um for your your work might come from food or it might come from a walk or potentially you know like the dogs that you've looked after in New Zealand or what whatever you've experienced I suppose that I want to ask if it's okay with you just to sort of um have a bit more of a an idea of which other like which other disciplines are you most drawn to? Because I know that from kind of following your Instagram that you you make your own clothes and shoes, for example, and you're you're a, you're in charge of a press, so you make these beautiful zines. And mm-hmm. I suppose, like, which other um, like who's your favorite artist, for example, or your favorite musician, or what's your favorite? what's your favorite tree what's your favorite color Mm -hmm. like because I think all of that feeds into your book um Mm -hmm. so yeah that's not too general a question (laughs) (laughs) lots of questions there no that's really wonderful thank you um yeah I I do have a lot of uh different I guess modes of um creativity and and I am sometimes the type of person that will start something and then um, you know not finish it necessarily so I have mm-hmm. lots of different mm-hmm. projects but at the moment um, I yeah I'm becoming more interested in visual in ways that I am kind of visually creative and how that interacts with writing and I because I think it is very connected um, but I'm not you know I'm not a visual artist but um, like you said I uh, last year got into making clothes and mm. um and I have always I think been interested in textiles and um textile art really interests me um and I like to think about poems as um physical objects too yeah and um maybe poems that are like woven woven texts even yeah <laughs> so yeah and I think I also think of essays like this sometimes too like an essay might have really? many threads so at the moment I, I I'm definitely interested in this and um and because yeah I'm also quite obsessed with color um yeah. that comes out <laughs> in lots of yeah. different ways and and maybe in in because I enjoy cooking as well so I'm often thinking about that in relation to cooking and yeah. then um gardening sometimes yeah. too. so I'm definitely in in the last couple of years wanting to embrace all these other um parts of my life which might not seem uh that might not seem like they're directly connected to my writing but actually but they are they so are yeah they yeah. it's all parts because because I think as writers we just we literally cannot be like writing all the time yeah <laughs> there's so totally. many things in I, our lives yeah I remember 
totally I remember seeing an interview with Sophie McIntosh she said that we can only or she could only really ever write that there are four hours in the day of writing Mm -hmm. and like even if you had a full day she was saying that you know she she wrote just the same amount as when she was working full time you know Mm -hmm. in a different job and it kind of I think what you said is right like they do they Mm-hmm. I can I can see what because I follow your Instagram as well I could see those threads in the book really clearly mm. um, in particular where you talk about food and and gardening and plant life in general mm. so what's your what's your favorite flower oh um that's hard but I what came to my mind instantly so I should probably yeah. say it was uh magnolia flower. <laughs> yeah yeah they're just so big and ridiculous yeah, and totally kind of crazy how big they are yeah and it, it's, 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 well I I feel like it's probably poppies like mm. I didn't but but when they're ahead when they're dried out yeah, yeah. rather than when they're open interestingly I love um, the way they suddenly open yeah you look at it one day and it's so tightly shut and then it just like unfills <laughs> and they're so sculptural right mm-hmm. they're they're so and when you see them kind of dancing they're yeah mm-hmm. I do like kind of how that in your work you talk about things like that so um mm-hmm. one of my favorite lines is sometimes home is not a place but a collection of things that have fallen or been left behind and then you go on to list the different things and I suppose what I would like to ask you if it's okay is that in your really beautiful book what the reader comes away with or what some readers might come away with is the idea that home isn't it's not a place I suppose what is home to you is it a a way of thinking is it a way of living is it a feeling what Mm -hmm. what does home mean if that's not too broad a question Mm -hmm. I think um I think I figured out slowly that it's it's maybe a feeling more than anything else um but I maybe will never really know the answer and will always (laughs) always be writing uh towards it but um I think maybe in writing the book I it was useful I think maybe I figured out what home is not (laughs) yeah and, and w- which is maybe just as you know useful and, and just in in the notion that home is not one single place or not it doesn't have to be the place you were born or the place you live now you know yeah. um and for me it's I've kind of only recently been able been very kind of comfortable with the fact that it's just always going to be two to three or maybe four different places all at once yeah. and and yeah and that's always quite confusing and um yeah. and so I think in my writing I'm always um trying to be okay with that and trying to bring myself closer to the feeling um and I think also home is in other people and, and objects around us, which I'm very interested in and kind yeah. of what objects we carry with us. And, you know, they could be such tiny, small objects or, you know, or it could be a, a place, a room. Yeah. And so I'm just, I think I'm interested in all the, the multiple definitions yeah. of home that we carry inside us. Mm. That's really beautiful. So if you were going to say move from your home just now to a really small dwelling, just say you were going to move into the back of a small van or a really small narrow boat, what would be three things that you would have to bring with you if you had to choose? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so hard, especially after kind of 18 months of being in one in one place. Yeah. Um I would have I would bring a poetry book the first one that came to mind is I would bring um 
the I've got a copy of Night Sky with Exit Wounds wow. by Ocean Wong that that's mm. signed by Ocean when I met him at a reading and so I think I would bring that <laughs> yeah that's a lovely um, one and, all, and then the next thing that comes to mind is that I need to bring food, but maybe that doesn't count. So what what <laughs> of the items of clothing that you've made would you bring with you? Which thing would you bring Great. that you've made? Yeah, so I would definitely bring a, a quilted jacket that I made okay. last autumn, and it was a huge project. I probably won't undertake anything like that, <laughs> long, but I'm so proud of it, and it's reversible. <laughs> get amazing <laughs> yeah, she'd want it not wearing it now. it's fine um I would I would bring that actually it's very warm and I, I I was deliberately kind of trying to I was inspired by these um Chinese cotton jackets that are kind of like quite they're actually not trendy at all but maybe they're coming back in in a kind of vintage kitsch kind of way yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> And um, um, I think when you said that it was kind of autumnal colours, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was what your because, you know, when we think of nature writing currently, and that's something that I think the, the Nan Shepherd Prize is doing really well with is kind of challenging our idea of who gets to write nature writing and, you know, what does it look like and from what kind of point of view. But for you, um, do you feel like there's a season that you're more drawn to for your creativity? Like, is there a home season for you where you write your best work or you kind of come up with your best ideas or you feel more at home in your sense of your creativity? Mm, that's such a beautiful question. Um, it's it's tricky. It, it maybe depends where I am, but mm. I, I, what I first thought of was, perhaps like spring and autumn yeah. which I think of as transitional um mm. obviously in between each season there's always a transitional feeling but yeah and maybe like at the moment how we're kind of slowly transitioning into autumn and it's much darker now yeah. um although I do love summer and I love the sun I think yeah maybe these periods of change are what I'm quite interested in and quite and come back to again and again in my writing yeah um, particularly spring when which is so in here in in London especially it was like my first it almost felt like my first experience of a real spring was when I came here obviously yeah. that's not true but it was just so yeah. sudden and so pronounced with the daffodils and the crocuses and yeah. um, in New Zealand our spring is quite different also very mm. colorful mm. but um, it's somehow not as abrupt and so that was really fascinating to me I think yeah. I keep writing about it totally the different places are shine better in different seasons I suppose mm -hmm. or bring parts of us out um, I just want to remind people that we're going to be um, bringing audience questions and answers and um, there's a little form beneath the video um, so please send any questions in for Nina and I'll try and get through as many as possible um, so I suppose the the idea of I remember I think it was last year you were or maybe the year before you were either due to or you did do a festival where you were going to be talking about wild swimming or swimming out, outdoors or something and I remember you saying something like I I don't know why I should be doing this like I'm not the expert or something like can you remember something along the lines of that um and I suppose that I'm really drawn to the idea with your work and with a lot of other writers that there's not this need to be an expert in something to just experience it and to really love it and for that passion to come through which it does in your work and um, swimming is and even just like water in general like being close to it in and it being in your dreams um, runs the whole way through the book and I suppose what I wanted to know um, is what what does water do for you like wh what is its attraction what does it not that it owes us anything or whatever, but what does it do for you? What does water mm -hmm. do for you? Um, I love what you said as well about uh, not, yeah, not needing to be an expert and kind of giving yourself permission, which I think is something I've 
slowly learnt mm. and given myself over the years and yeah absolutely with with swimming because I'm not a you know I'm, I don't even swim in the depth of winter I swim in autumn so but I think water is um yeah it, it, it sounds a bit cliche but it definitely gives me strength I think mm. or, or rather like resilience um just if, if we're talking in, in physical terms uh, when I swim, I, I just feel a lot stronger than I do on land. <laughs> and, yeah. and there's a clarity, I think, that comes with it for me. And it kind of resets my body. Actually, probably not so much my body, probably more my mind and my heart. Um, and then afterwards, I always feel kind of a little bit more resilient and yeah. a little bit less stressed. But yeah, I think on a very physical level that's that's what it gives me and it has always has since I was very young um and then on a wider level I guess I love to think of it as a connect a connective force and the yeah. f- fluidity of all its different forms something I'm interested in and, yeah. and portraying that in writing and the challenges of that I think is is what I kind of try to do a lot in the book yeah and you did really well mm-hmm. um and and something one of the for me one of the most beautiful threads in the book is how you look at um how you look at language and identity and how you weave them together because it's it's really difficult i think talking about any form of um identity and belonging at all is is difficult but to do it in the written form is even more so um and i i wonder i wonder firstly um how you feel that language how you look at language is it different how you deal with it in your poetry than how you deal with it in your prose because you you do deal with it um in both so beautifully and is there a difference in how you approach language and belonging with your poetry head on or with your prose? Mm. Um, I think it's becoming more and more uh, connected and I keep writing kind of bits of prose that end up feeling quite a lot like poems and also vice versa. So yeah. my, I used to think of, um, yeah, my poetry and then my essays is quite separate, mm-hmm. but they're definitely kind of combining. And although I think I, Poetry is what where I first tested right kind of these ideas mm-hmm. writing about um, what it means to lose a language or leave behind a language and then try to come back to it and like retrace your steps towards it as an adult, which is really hard and um, an experience that lots of people share. And so I was really mm-hmm. interested in that. And it's in poets. Um, there's so many poets that have inspired me in this way, but one of them is Safia El Hilo. Mm-hmm. Um, another is uh, Mary Jean Chan, just as an example. And I love the way they incorp- incorporate their heritage languages and writing about their family within poems. And so I think it's in poetry where I first got this confidence and gave myself this permission mm-hmm. to then try it out in an essay. And so I think in, in the section of the book, which is about language, I found myself um, kind of surprisingly going deeper than I thought I would into kind of Mm -hmm. cultural history and the context of the Chinese written script, which is something I use a lot in my poems, but don't necessarily incorporate too much research or background Mm -hmm. information. But in in an essay, there's more space for this. And so I really enjoyed doing that. and yeah coming at it from different perspectives and always thinking of um, myself as I'm kind of a lifelong language learner of Chinese and I'm never I feel I'm never really going to have fluency although I think there are other types of fluency than just being able to speak I think there's kind of physical fluency Um, but yeah so I wanted to approach it as you know not an expert but a, a learner as someone who left it behind and then is slowly coming back to it and so yeah thank you that was a 
brilliant question. <laughs> um, yeah, because I was really inspired by how you spoke of language, and I know I know other people were as well. Um, and then I think I've got time for one last question before I'm <laughs> going to ask you to do a reading because I'd love to hear you read your work. Um, but you something that comes across in your book really beautifully is the I suppose that the dance between your dream life and your lived experience of the world and there's a lot of crossover between them and I suppose um could you talk a little bit about what dreams mean to you do you do you like do you love your dreams do they mean a lot to you (laughs) Mm. um yeah I dream very vividly and I always have but yeah I certainly don't love my dreams. I I definitely have weird, uh, just very strange dreams most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but I I do feel that they, they often come into my writing. And I think it it was in a class I did with the poet Rachel Long, Mm -hmm. where she, she made us keep a dream diary for six weeks or something, Mm -hmm. which was, not something I'd ever done before, but I ha- I did have the sense that sometimes there would be something really memorable or strange, really colorful kind of image that might occur in my dream. And then yeah. later I'd kind of wish I, I could grasp it better. Well, very often we have this yeah. feeling about our dreams, you know, um, but this was an amazing exercise and she, and, and, it, and realizing that, you know, we dream every night, but we just don't remember them all necessarily and so forcing myself to write them down was very Mm. strange and um not always fruitful but fascinating very weird and and I kind of became more interested in uh, because I I do have I think I have a couple of weird recurring dreams I won't go into detail now but it's in the book (laughs) but (laughs) but, um yeah and and I, I think I'm quite an obsessive person and so I think, yeah, things that I'm obsessing over, certainly worrying about, mm-hmm. they come up in my dreams. And so I'm interested in that. Yeah. And I I think, yeah, I think my dreams are often a very, a very accurate um, kind of barometer of how I'm mm-hmm. feeling or mm-hmm. it's true for many of us. Although sometimes not, yeah. you know, sometimes it's just very weird. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah. I, I think inevitably, um, I don't know, maybe because I'm a poet, I yeah. I will often often be writing about my dreams. Yeah. I I just I remember someone saying once, don't write about your dreams and just <laughs> thinking it was such a ridiculous thing to say. Like it just didn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. And I'm really glad that you write about your dreams. Mm-hmm. Um so just quickly before you read from your beautiful book, um, I want to quickly ask you, um, who you've already touched on this before, but um, who are the writers today that are really inspiring you and are really kind of nourishing you and feeding you just now? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I feel that I've, it's been quite difficult to read in recent months, but um, just in the past couple of months, I, I've slowly got back into it and there's a beautiful memoir that came out, uh, I think at the same time as my book called Crying in H Mart by an American writer called Michelle Zorna. And she's also a musician and, so, and her music I knew before her writing. Mm-hmm. And um, her book is so beautiful and it's really a food memoir. And so yeah. that was so nourishing, just the absolute mm-hmm. kind of definition of a nourishing book to me, which is quite rare. Mm-hmm. So that was really lovely. Mm-hmm. And I know it's a book I'll keep coming back to again and again. Um, and then I, I'm, I think I'm, I read more poetry than anything else. And that kind of, yeah. I find that quite refreshing. And because sometimes I have very short attention spans. So poem, it's very useful being able to kind of read a poem. Yeah and uh yeah like a poem a day and uh, a poet that's really important to me who I think influenced this book a lot is an American poet called Laylee Long Soldier she's a Native American poet and the way she writes about language actually specifically and recovering lost language Mm. had a really deep impact on me I think 
Um, but yeah, there are so many. And in yeah. nature writing though, I would say, Kerry, your book um, has been, you know, it's an, an, an extraordinary work, that book. And the way that you write about, like you were saying before, this you yourself in the landscape um, in your body mm. and um, liminal spaces and these kind of in-between places that was yeah that I had that was definitely a nourishing book yeah, for me as well really kind of you and Nina I would love to ask you to read from your beautiful book which I will return to again and again and I know loads of people will so will you read for us <laughs> I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll read from the beginning of the book, um, the essay that we mentioned earlier, actually. Where is the place your body is anchored? Which body of water is yours? Is it that I've anchored myself in too many places at once or nowhere at all? The answer lies somewhere in between. Over time, springing up from the in-between space, new islands form. My first body of water was the swimming pool. Underwater, I was like one of Gung Gong's little silver fish with silver eyes. Like one of those he catalogued and preserved in gold liquid and jars on the shelf in the room where I slept, trapped there, glimmering forever. It was here that I first taught myself how to do an underwater somersault, first swam in deep water, first learned how to point my toes, hold my legs together and kick out in a way that made me feel powerful. Here we spent hours pretending to be mermaids, but I thought of myself less as a mermaid and more like some kind of ungraceful creature since I didn't have very long hair and wasn't such a good swimmer perhaps half orca, half girl. To swim in Wellington Harbour is to swim in the deep seam between two tilted pieces of land that have been pulled apart over time. Repeated movements along the Wellington Fault have caused cliff formations to rise up above the harbour's western shore. Little islets, Makado, Matu, and Mokopuna, which punctuate the narrow neck of the harbour, are actually tips of a submerged ridge that runs parallel to the Tanifa-shaped Miramar Peninsula. Near Oriental Bay, the harbour carries debris from a summer storm just past. Shattered driftwood, seaweed blooms, plastic milk bottle caps, the occasional earlobe jellyfish. The further out I swim, there is a layer of clear molten blue. It's January, the height of summer, and I've flown home from Shanghai where I've been living for a year studying Mandarin. My friend Carrie and I dive above and below the rolling waves. At this moment in our lives, neither of us knows exactly where home is but underwater, the question doesn't seem to matter. Emerging from nowhere, a black shape draws close to my body and I lurch, reaching for Carrie. But then I see the outline of wings. The black shag is mid-dive, eyes open, wings outstretched and soaring down into the deep. Kawo Pu, the native black shag, they perch on rocky beaches all over the Wellington coastline, holding their wings open to dry in the wind and sun. Another wave rises over us and we turn our bodies towards it, opening. Home is not a place, but a collection of things that have fallen or been left behind. Dried agapanthus pods, the exoskeletons of cicadas, tiny ghosts clinging to the trees, the discarded shells of quail legs on pawpaw's plate, cherry pips in the grass, the drowned chrysanthemum bud in the bottom of the teapot. Some things are harder to hold in my arms. The smell of salt and sunscreen, mint green blooms of lichen on rock, 
wind bent Pahutakawa trees above valleys of driftwood. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was absolutely gorgeous. Um, people can keep sending in their questions, but I'm going to start running through some that are here already. Um, and this is a question that I really wanted to ask as well. So um, what is Nina planning next, whether that's a book, a poem or something else? What are you working on right now, Nina, or hmm. moving uh, towards? Yeah, I, I still feel at the moment I'm in a kind of quiet in between phase. <laughs> but mm. that said, um, I think I would really like to write more about food and about um, comfort and pleasure and resistance um, and the body. <laughs> That's a lot of things. Incredible. But um, yeah, I have, you know, I mean, I'm not working on it yet, but I think I have an idea that I would love to write something that is more, I think more bits of, poetry maybe interwoven with prose so a kind of hybrid work yeah because I mean this book small bodies is not it's not particularly long but for me no. it was very very long yeah <laughs> and I feel that I can kind of never write anything as long again it might not be true <laughs> but right now I feel that I have yeah. to kind of work on very short things yeah so I'm think I'm kind of feeling more drawn towards poetic forms and yeah. food writing mm. and I think that sounds incredible but I think um you said you're not really working on it but you are I think if you're <laughs> if you're even it's percolating right it's like um maybe yeah I will all adore it um and I, I'm really drawn to this idea of um pleasure and and resistance and how they kind of because I think you're right they are kind of linked but anyway maybe that's for another time so I've got another question here um what advice would you give um for those wanting to get into nature writing mm, um, question. yeah I think that for me reading as much as I could was really crucial for me um but that didn't just mean kind of reading things I like necessarily, because I think it's important to discover what you don't like and yes. kind of maybe the kind of writing that's not for you. Yes. And so that's really important. And that maybe doesn't necessarily just mean reading nature writing, but just yeah. reading as broadly as you can. But on a more kind of practical level, um, I think, yeah, the fact that, the Nan Shepherd Prize exists now is amazing because I think the definition of nature writing is is becoming broader and broader yes. which is amazing um, because yeah. when I was starting out I didn't really necessarily think of myself as a nature writer still I kind of think yeah. I, sometimes I am sometimes I'm not um, but the amazing <laughs> thing about that prize is, is it um, welcomes submissions that you know maybe environmental writing but also place writing about place um, yeah. whether urban places or rural places yeah. and I think kind of maybe almost every writer is in some way writing about place okay. um, so I think yeah maybe I find lots of new writing online and I find I find that really useful mainly Twitter <laughs> <laughs> um, journals like the Willow Herb Review I yeah. couldn't recommend enough to kind of yeah. get a sense of what the possibilities of nature writing and that includes poetry fiction and non-fiction okay. um, and so many different forms and also to get a sense of the kinds of things that journals can be looking for um, and submission requirements those kinds of kind of boring but really important things yeah so I'd really recommend that journal which is the Willow Herb Review um, yeah I think that that was really well answered and I think probably really helpful for lots of people and this question kind of comes in quite nicely after it which is um how do you see yourself in the tradition of nature writing and are there historic writers that you're drawn to mm. Mm. um that's a great question because yeah I I 
kind of until very recently didn't really see myself in the tradition of nature writing because when I think of that I kind of more think of um when you step into a bookshop and there's quite often a table and yeah covers are very often like pictures of the ocean or pictures of trees yeah. and um and and I think here in in the UK especially in Ireland as well there's such a strong yeah. tradition of nature writing yeah I didn't necessarily see a place for myself at the beginning at all um but now I think this book it kind of does fit on that table but I love also that it can fit I don't know like with other essay collections or with yeah. perhaps travel writing which is yeah. itself a, a kind of murky genre but it could yeah. fit there or more just memoir writing about girlhood and the body yeah so I think I see myself as very much yeah connected to yeah. the nature writing tradition but also trying to really broaden it as much as possible um and I think yeah Harry's book brilliant book Thin Places does this too mm. I think um Jessica Lee's books do this yeah. as well totally. there are many writers now today doing that which is incredible well, I'm and, mm. I'm really glad that your book is on that table and it has it it deserves to be there um I like that you talked about your cover and I like that the mm -hmm. reviewer today talked about the cover which is by mm -hmm. Gil Healy I'm just going to hold it up again um <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful and I think it really represents your book and you and I think you know we say we can't judge a book uh, by its cover but sometimes we can <laughs> and nature writing can be whatever it wants to be um but yeah so I think we've got time for one or two more questions so I'm going to really quickly run through you can keep sending them in by the way we've got a few more minutes um what oh this is a tricky one I think <laughs> what is your favorite body of water wow that's a Ooh. big old question <laughs> yeah no I love this question um <laughs> it changes obviously um at the moment I feel like you know I have not limited access but I live in I live in London there's not so many bodies of water I can access yeah. but you know a few times a week I do swim at the women's pond in Hampstead Heath and so yeah. in a kind of in terms of intimacy and familiarity yeah. at the moment that body of water is like literally keeping me going yeah. <laughs> but um but that said I think maybe if I pick one, it might be Wellington Harbour, uh, which is a, a very big body of water. And I love that when you swim in it, it feels almost enclosed because the entrance to the harbour is very, very narrow. Um, and yet sometimes, a few times a year, um, southern right whales and humpback whales and orca come through the entrance. And it's almost improbable because the it's such a narrow stretch of water mm -hmm. that they can enter um but it's very magical and yeah. there's hills all around and and that's where I grew up so. gorgeous that's a lovely answer I think this might be our last we'll see this is from Caroline Rybers I hope I've said your name right Caroline um she says I'm really interested in your thoughts on language especially when you talked about physical fluency it would be lovely to hear you expand on that. It's a lovely question. Mm. Yeah, I would love to. Um, I think for me, my kind of feelings about language are, have in the past been very much tied up with shame and with guilt and with embarrassment, kind of wishing I dedicated more time in my life to properly learning, uh, for example, well, the language that my grandparents speak is mainly Hakka, and I never really learned that and can't understand it either. So that's definitely one aspect of it. I wish I could have, you know, spoken to my grandparents more. And then there's Mandarin as well, which is kind of a more easily accessible language in, term of, in terms of learning and popularity and courses and resources. And yet I'm still not fluent in Mandarin. And then there's Cantonese as well, which my mum speaks too. So, and also another language uh, would be Māori today. And this week is Māori language week in New Zealand. And I also wish I was better 
with my Tadeo, but I'm working on it. So I feel, yeah, there's lots of different strands here, but I'm also interested in um, how language connects us to a place. And I think that's not just through understanding on a rational level, but um, emotional understanding and maybe just kind of pure um, childhood memories. Like for me, there are some, the sound, the way that a language sounds, especially Hakka and Mandarin is so familiar. Listening to it kind of feels like home, even if I have these feelings of sadness or guilt that I can't fully keep up. It brings me such joy to hear it. Um, last week I went to the movies, which was crazy mm -hmm. thing to do um <laughs> after a long time not going to the movies mm. and saw shang chi <laughs> which is great and i didn't realize so much of that movie is in mandarin and i felt so emotional i could even understand oh. bits of it which was lovely but yeah things like that i'm interested in in those exchanges that we have with language um which go beyond uh go beyond understanding on a surface level but mm. yeah because for me i think Fluency is about uh, memory and childhood, belonging, and we all have different, we're at different levels with languages, we have different relationships to it, and um, yeah, I'm just, I'm all for being kinder to ourselves <laughs> when it comes to our different relationships to our languages. I totally agree with you and that was really beautifully put we've got time for one more question and I'm just gonna it's gonna be my question <laughs> selfishly um what is your favorite meal to cook for yourself mm. um it's gotta be when I have time usually on the weekend I will make a really big batch of dumplings and I'll make the dough as well which I haven't done in a really long time because I've, I've been like too exhausted, which is a shame, but I will do it soon. Um, and I'll make like 50 or 60 and I'll put most of them in the freezer. And then for like two weeks or sometimes it doesn't last that long. Mm -hmm. I will like, my lunches will be glorious because I'll have dumplings yeah. for lunch like every day. Um, but it does take a long time. So I don't do it that often, but that's probably my favorite thing. Um, probably like gorgeous. pork and ginger dumplings beautiful that sounds so gorgeous and such a lovely experience um nina thank you so much um for <laughs> the beautiful answers to the questions and for your absolutely gorgeous book small bodies of water which can be bought um through the british library and in lots of lots of nice little independent bookstores um thank you so much to the british library for hosting us as part of the natural world there is a series on climate change and nature writing and as nina said the nan shepherd prize is currently open so if anybody wants to enter they can um nina thank you so very much and i'm just really excited about watching this book meet all its readers and any book you write hereafter thank you nina yeah. Thank you so much, yes. Kerry, and everyone else for their questions as well, and just for, for tuning in. Thank you. Bye. 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 A huge thank you to Nina and Kerry for that fascinating conversation. And just a reminder that if you do want to buy a copy of the book, uh, you can use the button above the video. Uh, you can also donate to the library, and we'd love to hear what you thought about the event, so please do send us your feedback. If you enjoyed this event, please do check out our season on nature writing and the environment, and that's called The Natural Word. We've got lots more great events coming up through the autumn. Thank you and good night from the British Library.